powerful, impactful, life-changing. This is the teaching ministry of Apostle Faith Manoeira, where supernatural things are happening through the anointed Word of God. This prolific preacher and dynamic teacher of God's Word is changing lives all over the world. Are you ready? Because your life will never be the same. Your success is directly related to your submission to God's Word. We are not here to do what we think or feel. We are here to do what God's Word has approved. If you're going to succeed in life, God must come first in everything you do. Faith in God does not fail because its origin is God. Here is Apostle Faith Man Owen. Today I'll be sharing on great values for great ministry. Great values for great ministry. If your ministry is going to be on the cutting edge, your gifting will not be enough. There is a need for values that people could look up to that can inspire them to do the will of God. Your value reflects what you believe. You know, someone could teach, but in lifestyle, they don't reflect what they teach or preach. We want ministers who preaches what they do, not who just preach and expect people to do, and they are not the doers. James said that the doers of the word is blessed. One of the ways your ministry can become effective and productive is when you become a doer of the word. There are a lot of excellent teachers, but they are not excellent doers of the word. And if we're not doers of the word of God, it will be difficult for we to bring ministry and direction to people. Is it Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ? Because he's following Christ as his focus. Because he was following Christ, he wanted people to understand that the only way you can become a great leader is when Jesus is your focus, and then your lifestyle can also influence your leadership. There is a great danger in ministering the word of God to people without being a doer of what he tells people to do. There is a great danger. In any aspect of ministry, you have found yourself, you need to represent God in a such a way, everyone that listens to you or everyone that comes in contact with your ministry can tell that you have a relationship with God. In every relationship, there are key things to value. Honoring one another, Submission to one another, protecting one another. Honoring one another, submission to one another, protecting one another. Your value, your values as a minister is important in deciding the longevity of your ministry. There are many people who are where God anointed heavily, greatly. God anointed them, but their character destroy their ministry. A lot of people left them. A lot of people abandoned them because their attitude was in opposition to God's word. To be an effective leader, you need to cultivate values that are consistent with God's word. To be an effective leader, you need to cultivate values that are consistent with God's word. If I don't cultivate values that are consistent with the word of God, it will affect the delivery of the message that God has given to me. People shouldn't come into our life 
and find something different from what we teach and preach. When they come into our life, they should be able to see what we preach and teach, that that is actually our way of life. Jesus said something. He said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. As a great minister of the gospel, your lifestyle has a lot to do with the message you bring to God's people. Your lifestyle has a lot to do with the message you bring to God's people. You, you can preach holiness and you are not holy. You can preach to people to give and you are not a giver. You can tell people to love and you're being conquered by your friends. You can tell people to do what is right, but you are doing what is wrong. No, every true minister of the gospel must reflect the word of God in every aspect of their life. Their marriage must be a marriage based on God's word. Their business, if they're into business, must be a business consistent with the word of God. If they're doing jobs, they must do the job according to the knowledge of God's word. Jesus was right sharing in Matthew's gospel. Jesus was sharing, he said, we are the city set on the hill. He said, we are the light of the world, Matthew chapter 5. As a city set on the hill and the light of the world, you are expected to manifest your true identity. So values are very important when it comes to ministry. There are a lot of people with great charisma, but not with a great character. They have a great charisma. They could preach everybody. They could minister to people and people could shout. But when you relate to them, then you got to find out that these people are just professional preachers. You know, there are those who are professional preachers. They just preach for living. Huh? That's not what God is calling us to do. We don't have to be professional preachers. We have to be, we have to be worshipers because when you understand ministry from the perspective of worship, you prosper in the things of the Spirit. When you understand ministry from the perspective of worship, that's why I said, uh, I said some few days back, I said, if you're going to be a productive minister, you need to understand that worship is a major part of your ministry. When I said worship is more than song, worship is a lifestyle that is based that is based on God's word, like a lifestyle that originates from the word of God. When you say you're a minister of the gospel, your lifestyle should reflect should reflect who you submit to. Because if you truly submit to Jesus, there are things you cannot do. If you truly submit to Jesus, there are things you can't touch. If you truly submit to Jesus, there are company you can keep. If you truly submit to Jesus, you want to do things to glorify him. Your lifestyle as a minister of the gospel has a lot to do with the future of the ministry God has given to you. There are a lot of people who are not sincere. I'm sorry to say this. They are preaching the gospel. They are not sincere to people. They are not sincere to their spouse. They are not sincere to their children. We don't want that kind of ministers. We want ministers that their yes is their yes. Their no is their no. We don't want ministers that will cook up results. What is not happening and then they say it's happening. They are not reaching anybody. They say they are reaching someone. No. But we got to do ministry from a point of being transparent to people. Because when you're transparent and people get to know it, it is going to be easy for you to do the ministry. But when people discover that the minister tells a lot of lies and he cheats, he manipulates, he you know, Jesus said, by your fruit we shall know them. Nobody can hide himself for a long period of time. People will know you. People will come to say, ah, this is how she behaved. This is how he behaved. We need to have a lifestyle that reflects the assignment we are called to carry out. We need to have a lifestyle. We can be a minister, but we'll have double standard. Hallelujah. But our standard, people should be able to look at us and say, I could see through this man's spirit. I could see through this woman's spirit. She is a woman of God. He's a man of God. People could look at you, whether you're ministering in song, 
or in any aspect of ministry God has called you into, you are expected to reflect the word of God. If you're going to build great values to do a great ministry, the first foundation is the word foundation. You must have a very good foundation of God's word. Your foundation of God's word will also determine your perspective to ministry. In Colossians 3, verse 16, Colossians 3, 16, uh, Paul was writing, he said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You see, when it comes to ministry, it is the word of God in your spirit that, that, that is going to open the door for the ministry. If you're really going to minister to people in a such a way that God is going to be glorified, it is because of his word in your spirit. If the word of God is not in your spirit, you don't have ministry to do because you do ministry from the word of God. So in Colossians 3.16, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. When the word of Christ dwells in you richly, which is the word of God, it determines your thinking. It determines your attitude. It determines how you respond to the issues of life. It determines how you pray. It determines who you will relate to and how you're going to carry out the ministry that God has entrusted to your care. If God's word is not in our spirit, it will be difficult for we to do the will of God. For we to do the will of God, we need the knowledge of the written word. Because the knowledge of the written word equips us to function according to God's purpose for our life. So if you are going to develop great values, the word of God is the foundation. You know, God's word has established a parameter for ministry. I've also established a parameter for our attitude. Also, it has also established a parameter for how we function and for the things we do. So if the word of God is not in my spirit, it will be difficult for me to walk in love. Because in ministry, there will be offenses, there will be situations or challenges that we're going to experience in ministry sometime. But if the word of God is not in your spirit, you can be trapped in offense and bitterness, which will have the potential to destroy your ministry. And there are so many people today that offense and bitterness have destroyed the ministry that God gave to them. So the word of God in your spirit will empower you to develop compassion. Because if you don't have compassion for people, so how do you bring ministry to them? So for we to develop compassion, the word of God must be in our spirit. So in 2 Timothy 2.15, when Paul was talking to Timothy, he said, he said, study to show yourself approved to God, a woman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He said, you cannot rightly divide the word of truth without fellowshipping with the word of truth. You have to fellowship with that word for you to be able to divide the word. If the word of God takes root in your spirit, it will show in your speech. It will show in your language. It will show in your communication. You know, the, the word of God talk about that our, our, our words should be seasoned with salt, so should be graced. You know, that the words that proceed out of your mouth is not hurting people. It's not killing people. It's not destroying people's esteem. There are communication that, that destroys esteem. So as a minister of the gospel, the, the, the word of God in your spirit is what will determine how you cultivate values that are consistent with God's will for your ministry. You see, when a person is gifted and they lack character, it will be difficult for them to provide healthy leadership. If a person is gifted, but he has no character. If the person is very charismatic, he's a charismatic person, he could carry people, but he has no character, he won't be able to sustain the leadership because your gifting is not enough for ministry. Your skills are not enough. It's good to be gifted. It's good to have the right skill for ministry, but without values, without right values, which is character, it will be difficult for this ministry to survive the storms and the wind because as a ministry leader, people expect you to function like Jesus. They expect you to manifest the word of God. They expect you to do things according to the knowledge of the will of the Father.
So God's word in your spirit is what determines the route for your future in ministry. The word of God in your spirit. So in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, in Joshua 1 verse 8, God said to Joshua, he said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but thou shalt meditate there in day and night, and you will make your way prosperous. You, you cannot be prosperous in character without having God's word in your spirit. You cannot be prosperous in the things of the spirit without having the word of God in your spirit. You cannot be prosperous in your God-given vision without the word of God in your spirit. So God's word in our spirit is the first foundation for cultivating values in ministry. You know, sometimes God, God has called us to do something great, something awesome, something beautiful, but we can't truly do it based on our natural ability. In the natural, we may be limited, but when we are connected to the leadership of the spirit through the word of God, there is no limit to our possibility. When we're connected to the leadership of the Spirit, you know, our relationship with the Holy Spirit is vital in becoming strategic in ministry. Our relationship with the Holy Ghost is vital in becoming strategic in the ministry. Our relationship with the Spirit of God. You see, when I do, if, I, if I have no good relationship with the Spirit of God, how do I receive from God? We receive from God through His Spirit. It is through the Spirit we will receive from God. So if we are going to be effective, if we are going to be productive, if we are going to be the kind of people that others will look up to, it simply means that our lifestyle to reflect what we teach, what we preach, not reflect it, it will be difficult to discover the deficiency. Uh, this guy is not consistent. This lady is not consistent. You know, inconsistency is one of the keys to failure in ministry. When people are not consistent, it can lead to failure. They are not consistent to instruction and trust to their care. They are not consistent in keeping their words. They are not consistent in following instruction and their God given leadership, it can affect how they present ministry to others. You know, someone can say, oh, yes, he has a great ministry, he has a great message, but his lifestyle is not right. He has a great ministry. He has a great message, but he abuses people. He says that, that your call to ministry doesn't give you a right to abuse anyone. That your call to ministry doesn't give you a right to talk to people anyhow. It doesn't give you the right to abuse people and, and say whatever. No, it doesn't give you the right. You're not called to ministry to humiliate people. You're called to ministry to build people up. And building people up should be your primary focus, not to pull them down. That when you speak, you speak so graciously that everyone who listens to you will find life in what they're hearing. We, sh we shouldn't be the kind of ministers that are full of ourselves and become arrogant maybe because we have this opportunity or that opportunity. The Bible said, resist, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Do you know that when people are ignorant of God's word, their action will not reflect the will of God? If a person is ignorant of God's word, their action will not reflect the will of God. So in building a great value, the word of God has to be the foundation. Number two, in building great value, our way of doing things must emanate from what God has spoken. Our way of doing things must emanate from what God has spoken, must come from what God has spoken. We can't just do things because it's popular. Don't do what is popular. Do what is consistent with God's word. That's how you may minister. A minister is not someone who is running around the whole place looking for what is popular to do. No, don't do what is popular. Do what is consistent and to the truth of God's word. In John Gospel chapter 8, where Jesus was sharing, he said, if you continue in my word, he said, this is how you cultivate value for ministry. He said, if you continue in my word, you'll be my disciples indeed. So the things you do must be consistent with what God has spoken. It shouldn't be based, okay, this minister is doing this. This ministry is doing that. I don't do what people do. I do what is consistent with God's word for my life. I do what is consistent with the word of God. Because
Because every action outside of God's word have no potential to produce the God kind of result. Every action outside of God's word have no potential to produce the God kind of result. If you want to see the God kind of result, then you have to do things according to the word of God. You have to do things according to into his word. When you do things according to his word, you prosper in the process of doing his will. In the process of doing his will. Now, if you look at the life of King Saul, Saul was a man that God felt he could be useful, but Saul turned his back at God with his attitude. And God raised David. There are people in the Bible, if you look at Ananias and Sapphira, how they lied. They were a couple. Acts chapter 5, they lied and look at what happened. Look at the problem they had. They were not truthful. If they have sold their land and say, well, we sold this land for $10 apostles, uh, but uh, well, $10 we sold this land, but we want to sow a seed of $500. Nobody have to bother you or stress you for what you give or what you don't give. So whatever we do, we should do it knowing that God is watching our motive, our intentions and action. Whatever we do, we should know that God is watching our motive, our intentions and action. Whenever you're doing something, God sees the reason why you said what you said. He's looking at your motive. He's looking at your intention. He's looking at the things you're saying. He's looking at your motive. You have to judge your motive for you to be able to do the things God has called you to do. You have to judge the motive. If the motive does not line up with God's word, there is no need to embark on that action. Oh, let me travel for this conference. Oh, I'll be able to raise money. He's not going to the conference because he wants to preach. He just wants to raise. That's not the way to do ministry, my friends. Oh, let me go for that conference. I'll be able to make this contact. I'll be able to make that. Let's not do things for the purpose of vainglory. Let us not do ministry for the purpose of vain glory. That whatever you are doing, you should be considering the purpose of God for your life. You should be considering God's instruction on your life. You should be considering what God expects you to do. Don't do things to get ahead. Do things to glorify God. Don't do things to get ahead in ministry or in life. Do things to glorify God and you will go ahead. Do things to glorify God. This is how you become more effective and productive in the ministry. Your values are important. Your values are important. People should see and say, this man is my leader because of the kind of value, because of the kind of action, because of the kind of things you do. Your values are important when it comes to ministry. Your values. Work on your values. Work on your character. Work on your attitude. Let me share my life with her. I should, I should be able to confine on her. You shouldn't be a kind of ministry leader that people are scared to confine on you. You shouldn't be a kind of ministry leader that people can't trust you and your sense of judgment concerning their situation. And this is why it's important that we we'll reflect Christ in everything we do. And this is the proof that we're doing ministry. If you truly say you're doing ministry, you have to reflect Christ on everything you do. The question you need to ask yourself, will Jesus be glorified with this action? Will the kingdom of God go forward by this action? Will the kingdom of God advance in fruit bearing by my action? If you don't consider the kingdom in your thinking, in your conversation, it is an indication that that ministry you're trying to do will not be produced because you are called into ministry to advance the kingdom. I want to say that again. I said you are called into ministry to advance the kingdom, not to advance you. You are not the ministry to get birth, to look for popularity. You know, a lot of people are looking for popularity. Oh, I want to be popular. Oh, I want to be popular. Oh, God, I want to be popular. That is not why we do ministry. In faithfulness, you can increase in influence. I said, in faithfulness, you can increase in influence. I want to say that again. I said, in faithfulness, you can increase in influence. One of the ways a person can become more strategic, more effective, more productive, is when they choose to stay faithful. You see, faithfulness is 
something you cultivate. It's not a gift. There is no gift of faithfulness. Faithfulness is what you cultivate. I can decide not to teach and nobody's going to do anything about it. I can decide not to preach again. But that is not what is going to make me. Because if you're not walking in obedience, you're walking against the will of God for your life. I have to show up even when it looks like, hey, man, you're so tired and you're pulling us step back to the table on your studio. Yes, I'm doing that because it's my calling. It's my calling. Being able to stay faithful to God is a decision. Cultivating faithfulness is a decision. In a lot of people's faithfulness is based on good times. If things are working well, they'll be faithful. But if things are not working well, they're not going to be faithful. That's not a leader. A leader is not someone who just do whatever he or she likes to do. A leader is someone whose way of doing things is consistent with God's word. His way of doing things is consistent with the word of God. That's a great leader. That you look at your way of doing things and say, who will hear about this? And then they are inspired to worship. They are inspired to grow in the things of the Spirit. They are inspired to do the will of God. They are inspired to follow the plans of God and the purpose of God. If you are going to cultivate great values, you have to be a person who stick with the principle of faithfulness. Be faithful in the things God called you to do in good times or in bad times. Be faithful. Don't be a kind of minister that every little thing that upsets you, you want to give up what God asks you to do. Don't be that kind of minister. Don't be that kind of minister that because something was not working well in your relationship or in your job or your finances, and then you say, God, I'm not going to save you. I'm just tired. If you really want me to save you, why not fix this thing? Why would it? We shouldn't tell God things like that. You shouldn't go to God and say, God, if you truly want me to save you, I want you to give me this pencil. This pain. God, if you want me to save you, give me this pain. God, if you want me to save you, remove the cover of this pain. God, if you want me to save you, fix the cover of this pain. God, if you want me to save you, fix it this way. We're just out there telling him what to do, like a threat. We don't threaten God. Nobody can threaten God. And let me say this to you. Whatever God has asked you to do, most times if I asked you to do it, there was someone God had already spoken to you, I've spoken to you to do it, but he didn't do it. Most times you may be the third person that God is asking to do that thing that you're doing right now. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. You may be the second or the third person is asking you to do that thing. See, when God says something to you and you're not willing to do it, he will go to the next person. You see, because the word of God must get to people. I believe that what I am doing today in the body of Christ, there are people also God has called them to do it, but most of them could have given God reasons why they can't do it. Like a friend told me this morning, he said, as long as you're faithful, there will be much result to show that there will be much things that God will always find a faithful man to use. Can you be faithful in good times and in bad times? Can you be faithful when you look like everything, the hell is breaking loose. No, stay faithful. We don't stay faithful because it's convenient. We stay faithful because it's the way of life. I said, we don't stay faithful because it is convenient. We stay faithful because it is a way of life. We don't stay faithful because it's convenient. Sometimes there are things you're called to do, but it's not convenient to you. The financial involvement is not convenient to you. To you in the natural, you say, my God, this bill is, is so much. But God said, I want you to trust me, to believe me, that I'm going to make provision available. When you walk by faith, it helps you to focus on the will of God. I want to say that again. I said, when you walk by faith, it helps you to focus on the will of God. You can truly focus on his will, except you're walking by faith. Your values as a minister of the gospel is important. Your values, what do you value? What do you honor? What kind of person are you? Are you an example to those you lead or to those that look up to you? Let me say this to you. The Bible said in the perilous time, in the last days, people will not endure some teaching. People will not endure some doctrine. We're in a time where you can rebuke someone and they get offended and they don't want to submit to instruction or to a God-given leadership and they feel like, well, I'm not going to submit to anybody. I can do whatever I want to do. You can't do whatever you want to do. You can only do what God has instructed you to do. 
You can do whatever you want to do. I can do whatever I want to do. No, if you try to do whatever you want to do, you will miss out on the will of God. You can only do things that are consistent with God's word. This is how you know a great minister. This is how you know a great leader is always willing to do things according to the word of God. I will read this scripture to you. In Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 8, in Philippians 4, verse 8, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, the very powerful scripture it said this. It said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things that are true, whatsoever things that are true, whatsoever things that are honest, whatsoever things that are just, whatsoever things that are pure, whatsoever things that are lovely, whatsoever things that are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Whatsoever thing that is true, whatever thing that is pure, whatever thing that is honest, these are the things to think on. You're a minister of the gospel. You, you, you need to have a healthy relationship with your wife, with your, with your wife, with your family. You need to. We should not have the kind of testimony that some crazy folks have. No. We should have a testimony that is in line with the word of God that people can look at us and come to us and say, what can I do about this situation? You shouldn't be the kind of leader that you easily give up on things because God is challenging you to grow in that area of your life. You should be able to face it. This is ministry. That becoming an example to people should be your primary priority. Becoming an example, you know, because look at what the, the scripture said. They said, he said, whatsoever thing that my family, my brethren, whatsoever things that are true, the question is the message you're preaching, is it true? Because there are people compromising the message because of what they can get out of people. Oh, oh, you, that message is so hard. I don't like you preaching that kind of message. Oh, that teaching is so hard. I don't want you to preach that kind of, You just preach to us once we get us excited. Being excited doesn't change your life. You need truth to change your life. As a minister of the gospel, you must be committed to bringing truth to people, whether it's what they want to hear or it's not what they want to hear. One thing about the truth of God's word is that it contains the ability of God to liberate people. So when you go ahead and bring to you know someone told me one time in a church, he was the, the preacher was preaching the word of God, and someone woke up to him and said, Well, I'm not gonna support your, your ministry anymore because of this kind of preaching you're preaching. I said, We change it. And because the pastor was scared, he has to begin to change the teaching because that woman was like a money bag to that ministry. Because if the woman withdraws according to the pastor, he felt that his ministry is going down to the to the down to the uh, down to, 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 to square one or back to the whole that was going to struggle. Let me say this to you. Don't preach to favor people. Preach to glorify God. Don't preach to favor people. Don't preach to favor people. Preach to glorify God. Don't preach to make people like you. You are not in ministry to be liked. That is not why you're doing ministry. This may be coming like a hard one today, but you just need to get this one today. You are not in the ministry to be liked by people. You are in the ministry to do the will of God. That's why you're in the ministry. And those who are pleased by you doing the will of God, bless our day. You are not in the ministry to be liked. You're not in the ministry to socialize. Oh, oh pastor, you know, you are just a, a very nice man. You're a very good man. Because you, you, you don't want to tell them the truth. You tell them the truth, whether they will tell you you're a nice person. Because there are so many people in this generation who don't want to hear the truth of God's word. You don't want to hear. They want to live the way they want to live and then expect God to put the blessing on how they live. That is not how God works. God is a holy God. God is a God of order. He said, let everything be done decently and in order. It is part of the structure for ministry. Let everything be done decently. You can be a leader and you live a life that has goals in it. You can be a leader and you are having extramarital affair, no ministry on hold. That is affecting the integrity because ministry must be done with integrity and credibility. I'm telling you, you have to do ministry. With integrity, your spouse may be having a adultery problem. Don't join him to do that because you will be accountable to God for your life. You need to be careful with things like this. And this is what God is saying to us today that your lifestyle should reflect my word, that my word should be the purpose of what you do, that whatever you're doing.
you should be consistent with my will. And if the will of God is your focus, you're going to flourish in ministry, you're going to flourish in purpose, you're going to flourish in great things. Many years ago, I was invited to a place to preach. Many years ago, I was invited to a place to preach. And when I got there, I saw this elderly man was preaching, you know, when the when the session was over, it was like a camp meeting. And then the host introduced the elderly man to me and told me, uh, this this man, I don't even know the man's name right now, you know. So it will just introduce ourselves. And then the man told me something I will not forget. He said, Why not invite me to your church? And I am going to raise money, and then I will give you the 40% of everything I've raised. I was shocked. He was telling me that, that he, he need to come to my church and then he will preach and then he will begin to raise money from people and then he will give me the 40% of the money, then he will take the 60%. You know, the Bible says, rebuke not an elder, you know, don't try to strive with an elder. I could have given that man a slap. If he was a younger person, I could have spanked him. I can spank kids sometimes. But I look at the man who was older than me, I could have spanked him. If he was a younger person, I could have spanked him. See, who told you to say that before me? But you see, he said that to me because he's, he is what people do in ministry these days. The preachers arrange themselves and say, okay, we'll do this, we'll take this person. We're not here to do that nonsense. That is not ministry, my friend. That is not the kingdom of God. That is not how God manipulation and deception will never take any ministry to the top. Manipulation and deception, that is not a gospel. That is not the will of God. A man was invited to a great church in the U.S. to preach. And when he got to the church, he preached the first night. Some of the Leaders came and met the pastor and said, the way that pastor was preaching, we don't like it. And if the pastor continues, we're going to leave your church. And he was wondering why the people, the pastor and I came to him and said, man of God, well, you cannot continue this revival. You need to leave. He said, what did I do? What did I do? What have I done that you, I will leave the place? The revival is like five days. He just preached the first night. Some of the leaders in that church came and told the pastor, you need to tell this preacher to go. If this preacher continues to preach, we are going to leave this church. And those people telling the pastor that were like the money bags of the church. So you know what happened? The pastor went and told the guest minister and said, well, man of God, you have to leave. He said, what did I do? He said, no, just leave. He packed his bag. And while he was going, he asked God a question. God, what have I done? Why would they push me out of that church that way? This revival is for some few days. I've just preached the first night. And they're driving me away. You know what God replied him? God told him, those church people have kicked me out of that church for a long time. I don't go to that church. God was telling him that he doesn't go to that church, that those folks kicked God eating out of that church that when they invited him he was wondering what he was going to do with them because he doesn't go to that church wow so there are churches god does not go to there are churches that people have have hijacked from god they have hijacked the church from god they have taken the church from god so god himself is outside of the church so there are buildings today, God is outside looking for a way to come in. They say, you can't come in here. We need to do our things. There are a lot of uh, exchange going on in the temple. And that shouldn't be us. We shouldn't be the kind of people that our way of doing things will put away the Holy Ghost out of the system. Our way of doing things will put his word out of the system. We should be the kind of ministry leaders that our lifestyle is an inspiration to others. We should be the kind of ministry leaders that can help others grow in the things of the Spirit. There's a kind of people we should be. That our lifestyle, you receive a message, and that message is dealing with an attitude in your life. You don't become offended at the preacher. You go home and say, Lord, help me to work on this area of my life. 
Lord, help me to develop this area. You don't say, oh, they just gossip me to their pastor. I know these people used to talk a lot here. They just gossip me. You know, sometimes when you're ministering the word of God, some people think that someone called you and maybe give them their full detail. They think that's what every preacher is doing. Some preachers may do that, but I don't do that. I went to a church, I'm sorry to say this, to bother you with all these stories and with all these experiences I'm sharing with you today. You know, I went to a church and the pastor was like holding my hand, prophesied to this woman. You know, he was telling me something I should tell the woman. That she, I, you know, I, I was wondering what could be wrong in this kind of churches. I'm so tired of these things. The people cannot be transparent in dealing with people. When it comes to ministry, let's allow the word of God to decide what we do, what we say, how we function. Let the word of God say. I used to say to my folks in church, I said, if you really want to serve God, serve him very well. And if you want to serve the devil, serve the devil so much well that when you boss him to hell, you won't be scared. You know why you're there. I've said it to people. If you want to serve God, give God everything, and if you want to go after the devil, go after the devil in such a way, you yourself know you are dining with demons. Don't be in between. I gotta make it clear. And there are many ministry leaders today dining with demons. You gotta know where you're dining. You gotta know who you're eating with and what you're eating. And whatever you're eating that is not in line with God's word, you should change those things you're eating and begin to eat the word of God. Let your ministry come from the word of God. Let your way of doing things line up with God's word. Let your character be a reflection. Be like Jesus. Walk like Jesus. Talk like Jesus. When people see you, someone has said something once time. I won't forget. He said, if, if, if some of you that are Christians today, if they are looking for evidences to convict you as a Christian, they won't find it. Because there is no enough evidence that you're living according to the word of God. There are people you cannot convict them that they're Christians. You know why? Because their lifestyle does not reflect the word of God. Jesus said, let your light so shine that men will see if you call into the ministry and show that the way you live your life in the public should not be different from the, your life in your home. Your life in the private and your life in the public must be the same. We shouldn't come to the public and we are all relaxed, we are all good, oh, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory be to Jesus, and then we go to our homes, we are like terrorists to our wives, to our children. No, that's not ministry. Let your light so shine. The men will see and glorify your Father in heaven. Pay attention to how you're living your life. Pay attention to what you do with your time. Pay attention of who you are relating with and who you're connecting with. Pay attention to what you're doing with your life. Pay attention. Don't just do what is popular. Do what is right. Don't do what people, everybody's doing. Don't say everybody's doing this. Apostle, everybody's doing this. I don't want to do what everybody's doing. I want to do what the world is doing. What the word of God asked me to do. That's what I want to do. As we round up this conference today, there is a need to look into your life and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Are there areas of your life? Are there secret relationships that nobody knows about but is hurting your ministry, your future? You need to ask God for help. Are there things you're battling with right now there are ministers who are battling with pornography. They, they are addicted to poems and they watch it and watch it and it's affecting them emotionally. It's affecting them mentally. There are things you need to discourage yourself from doing. There are things you need to burn. Are there things in your home that reminds you about Egypt, about going back into the wall? Are there things in your life that reminds you about sin and then you need to go burn those things and say, God, I don't want to keep these things around me. There are preachers who do magic. God didn't call us to do magic. He called us to walk by faith. You don't succeed in ministry by doing magic. You don't do ministry to impress people. You do ministry to glorify God. You don't do ministry to impress people. Oh, to, to be in the good books of people should not be your priority. Your priority should be to do the will of God. 
Being in the good books of people should not be what you're pursuing, what you're trying to be. I want to be in the good book of everybody. I want everybody to speak well about me. I don't want everyone to speak well about me. I just want God to speak well about me. I want the word of God to decide what I do, what I think, and how I function. I don't care who say whatever they want to say. I care what God will say because he's the one that called me. So I should live to glorify him. I should live to magnify him. Your values will determine your ministry. A great value is based on the principle of faith, love, hope, submission. Let me just share some of these values with you then. I'll be rounding up this conference today. If you want to cultivate great values, number one, Jesus said to us, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Love is important. When you love, you don't hurt. When you truly love people, you won't hurt them. You won't take advantage of them. Number two is the principle of faith. It's important that you walk by faith if you're going to do the will of God. Whatever God has called you to do, it is by faith you're going to do it. Number three is the principle of hope. You see, if you're not a person with hope, you'll be discouraged and then you walk away from what God has called you to do. The principle of hope is very vital when it comes to pursuing the vision God has given to you. The next point is the principle of submission. You must be a kind of spiritual leader who submits to instruction. You shouldn't be bossy. You shouldn't be a kind of leader that maybe if people want to suggest what they should do and you know it's right and you say, no, 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 we're not going to do that. I like people to come up with ideas. I like to, what, what do you think about this? What do you think you can do about this? I don't know everything. Can you make some suggestion? That's why we'll have our leadership meeting. I ask my people, can you make suggestion? Whatever suggestion that we feel that could work for us, we could all take it. I don't have to be the one bringing all the ideas in ministry. I don't have to be the one. You, you have to stay out of trying to be everything, every time to everybody. You have to stay out of that kind of thinking. So the principle of submission empowers you to learn how to receive from others. If you can't receive from others, you cannot be productive in what God has called you to do. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. I'm sharing the things God has dropped in my spirit. There are people I learn from. There are people I listen to. There are people who have been a blessing to me. And I'm here to say this to you. You must be a person who honors submission. If you can't work with others, it means there is a problem with you. I'm telling you, everybody cannot be wrong. Everybody cannot be wrong. You can't be a kind of person, oh, I don't want to work with this person. I don't want to work. Everybody cannot be wrong. Look at Jesus. He got to a disciple. Many of us are not reflecting our Savior, Jesus. Sometimes it, it troubles my heart. That when I look at some people, I say, they are preaching the gospel, but they don't behave like Jesus. I wonder what they're trying to do. You can't tell me about Jesus when you don't reflect his lifestyle. How can you tell me about Jesus? When you don't reflect his life, that's submission, being able to work with others. When you're trying to work with others, there will be things, there will be situations, then God wants to see how you'll be able to forgive them and do what is right. Offense should not distract you from your love work. Offense should not distract you from the love work. Just that you're being betrayed once doesn't mean everybody's going to betray you. Betrayal happens in ministry. In short, it came with the ministry. At the ministry of Jesus, 12 disciples, one betrayed him. Look at that. But he went ahead to do what he was expected to do. When people betray you, it means you're going somewhere great. So don't quit. Don't give up. Don't stop believing and keep going. The next key principle is the principle of listening to the Holy Spirit. If you truly want to be a person that is going to impact the lives of people, you need to listen to the Holy Spirit. This is how ministry grows. Listen to the Spirit of God. He has a word for you. He has a direction for you. He has an instruction for you. Listen to the Spirit of God. The next key is the key of friendship. You know, one of the things that I pray to God, I say, God, send me good friends. See, a good friend is a, is a gift from God. I've just noticed that some people can be around you, but they don't really love you. Truly. Somebody can be around you, they don't have you, they don't have your back. I'm telling you. So, as a minister, you need to believe God for good association. People that could look at your eyes and they could know what is going on. You know why a lot of pastors slum, a lot of leaders get frustrated? Because they are out there ministering to everybody, but nobody ministers to them. No one reaches to them. 
happen. No, everybody needs an encouragement, including the one who passed us right now. He needs an encouragement. So you had to do, do are you able to encourage? Are you able to be a kind of person who says, hey, I'm standing with you. I don't care what you're going through, but I am standing with you. You should be a kind of leader that pours back into the one that pours into you. So we have to believe God for good friendship for people who could look at you and say, man, I'm standing with you. Whether it's some, and they're not just saying they're standing with you. They're standing with you in their finances. They're standing with you with their prayer. They're standing with you by encouraging you. They're standing with you by defending you. They're standing with you by confronting you in case something goes wrong. They say, what really happened? You should have a friend that will look at you and ask you what really happened. There should be one person who can look at you and say, I don't think you have to do that. If most of us, all the people in our life, they are our loyalists. No, you can't have loyalists all true. There should be someone in your life that can say, man, I think this is the right way to go. Maybe you are to go the wrong way, but you look at you and say, man of God, woman of God, I don't think this is the right way. I don't think this is the right way. So if we don't have such kind of people in our life, we can be walking into hell and we don't know it. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. There must be people in your life that must look at you and tell you the truth and the way it is. It may hurt, but to heal. It may hurt, but it will do what? It will heal. If you're called to ministry, what you need is truth. Truth to deal with people. Truth to stay focused. Truth to pursue the vision. Because you can't build a great ministry under the influence of deception. You can't build a great ministry with lies and deception. And that was why Jesus said you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the grand finale of this conference. I just want to say a very big thank you to everyone connecting with me around the world and those that will watch in the nearby future. I just felt like God have just dropped this thought in our heart that we'll be able to look at ourselves, look at things and say, Holy Spirit, I just want you to help me. You know, sometimes you were praying, you know, I was, you know, yesterday, you know, when I look at what the Lord is doing in this ministry. It, it, you know, I, I was emotionally broken down yesterday. Tears just came out of my eyes because when I see what God is doing, how He's changing the lives of people, I, I tell you, it's, it's amazing. I, I, can't, I can't, in the natural, I can't comprehend this thing, but I just know that God has gone ahead of us. I just wanted to understand that, see, your assignment is important. Your calling is important. How you do it is important. How you relate to people. How you are able to open up. You should be a kind of Christian leader that people could look at you and say, man, I trust you. Thank you for being part of this conference. And I pray that God will strengthen you. I pray that God will empower you. I pray that God will help you. I pray that everything, maybe there are issues that you're dealing with right now, that the Spirit of God will help you overcome those issues, those challenging issues. Receive grace. Receive grace. Receive wisdom. Receive understanding to do everything God has called you to do. Thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you for watching this broadcast until I come your way soon. Don't forget this. There is greatness in you and Jesus is coming very soon.